All right. Thank you, everyone. And I see there are some messages in the chat. So let's, uh, I guess, start there and see where we are. All right, so there's been some general discussion of accessibility best practices. Please say no to overlays and similar AI fixes. Uh, the keyboard is a common assistive technology. That's a good reminder. Um, the uh, WAVE toolbar at wave.webaim.org was mentioned as a useful tool, um, but it was suggested trying out other accessible te accessibility testers as well because different tools interpret the standards differently. Uh, and Stephanie put in a word for Axe Dev Tools. And uh, it doesn't look like there are any questions, just discussion. So I went looking for that accessible developer document from Equinox, and I couldn't find it with a uh, a search that is the presentation to be linked somewhere so I can get to it that way. The the question in case you didn't hear was about the location of the Equinox accessibility guide, which is in the presentation, which I believe is in the, uh, the scanned. Oh, I didn't go to scan. Okay. Thank you. Uh I have a question to uh, previous presenters um, uh, regarding accessibility, because uh, in Leipzig, we are also uh, working for some years now on improving accessibility in our catalogs, but we always have the problem that um, it's very hard for uh, to test it because um, All the members in our team uh, do not have any uh, uh, disabilities, right? And therefore, it is very hard to uh, actually uh, um, do a, um, a real life test on the uh, accessibility implementations we perform. I mean, we use all the testing tools and all that stuff, and we all have these, uh, uh, enough of, uh, documentation and so on. But the, the real problem we have is to uh, have real life tests. And therefore, I would like to know, uh, did you, uh, when you were improving accessibility in your catalog, do you have uh, uh, any contact uh, uh, to organizations uh, uh, that, uh, or someone else uh, who could um, yes, uh, give you feedback by real life tests? We have not yet. Uh... We are working with some of our clients to arrange some time to do that with um, some of their constituents. It is really difficult um, when you don't use an assistive technology yourself to do that testing properly. Um, and I'm not that great with screen readers, I will tell you right now. Um, I struggle to use them. And uh, so finding people who can test for us is a priority. And I think that um, we um, can maybe leverage our community a little bit and um, find some folks who can help us out with that <laughs> and and help each other out um, in, in testing those things. And we have worked in a couple of cases with um, an expert subcontractor, the uh, Georgia State University Center or Georgia Tech, excuse me, Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation, CD. Um, they are uh, an organization um, comprised of, of they're, they're an accessibility uh, organization and they have done some assessments um, of the various interfaces that we've worked on. Um, they've done some VPATs for us on some open source products um, and they are accessibility experts, but they're not library experts. So that is kind of what Stephanie was alluded to. That's like the center of the Venn diagram that we would love to have um, is people who are both assistive technology users as they are at CD, as well as um, people who are who are library end users. So uh, we are definitely talking with some of our uh, big accessibility funders about starting some of that up front, and you know, just kind of basically having us having Stephanie, you know, watch them. How do how do you move through this interface with an assistive tool, and where are you hitting problems? 
So that's definitely on our horizon. The, the other thing I would maybe add to that is that there is a freely available screen reader tool, the name of which currently eludes me, though Peter and I recently used it. And while obviously the experience of a software developer who does not normally use uh, accessibility tools is not the same as a real power user of accessibility tools, I did find that extremely valuable when receiving a report of this is the behavior that is bad. I would like to see this behavior that is good, being able to actually experience the bad behavior, make changes, see if it helps. Uh, you know, even though I think it is very valuable to have outside expertise to give the overall view, it also is incredibly valuable to have access to some kind of tools so that you can fix the problems when they've been reported to you. Yes, Kate dropped a link in, in the chat to NVDA, which I think is probably the screen That's reader that the you one. Were you were testing. Yeah. Um, the the trick with that is that JAWS is a little different because it tries to compensate. If you um, if the developer has gotten things wrong, it will try to fill things in. And so it behaves differently than NVDA does. Um, and it behaves differently than VoiceOver and, and all of the other screen readers. So um, when you get into the accessibility world, you find all of these nuances of differences between like different combinations of browsers and, and operating systems and screen readers. And it's really challenging. Um, that said, NVDA has a transcript mode, uh, and JAWS also has, uh, like a text output of what it's reading. And I find those really helpful as someone with ADHD, I have an auditory processing disorder. And so listening to the screen reader is actually an accessibility challenge for me. Um, and so, uh, having that transcript of what it's reading is super, super helpful. And I love that feature. I also think a, a general principle that's always worth emphasizing is keeping it simple and keeping it as close to the standards is always a good idea for so many reasons. And it helps to reduce some of these crazy interactions that drive us crazy. But uh, mm -hmm. I realize it's not always possible, but it's good to aim for. <laughs> yeah, and it's good to do that from the beginning, which is what the kind of the goal of that accessibility developer's guide that Stephanie wrote. One of the goals is to, you know, have start from a, an accessibility perspective when you're developing, as opposed to what we're doing now, which is going back and fixing a lot of things. And then you've got the, well, we've had this workflow for however many years, what do you mean you're changing it, you know, thing. And, and it's just better if we start from that accessibility design perspective from the very beginning. That is a real challenge for these older um, open source products that have been around for a while and everybody is used to how they work. And then we come in and say, actually, we need to be doing things a completely different way. And everybody goes, no, don't, don't move my cheese. And um, yeah, we got, we got to move the cheese. It's uh, sorry for those of you who may not be from the U.S. There's a famous management book called Someone Move My Cheese or something like that. Um, yeah, people do not like change, um, and but we we've, we've been able to say, hey, we have a really strong um, argument for why this is bad um, for people using assistive technologies, and we've just got to change it. There's, you know, this is going to be a one-time thing. You'll get used to the new way of doing it. It's going to be okay, but we've got to we've got to get this done. And accessibility and usability in general often dovetail quite a lot. So, you know, we're giving frequently, everyone, everyone better cheese. Yeah, frequently if we make something more accessible, it ends up being better for even people who aren't using assistive right, technologies. for all users. But that change can be sometimes hard to navigate. Yeah. I, I will reinforce, you know, outside of Viewfind land, I manage some other open source projects, one of which is used by maybe five people, including myself. But I put some time into making that more accessible and... I found it a joy to use my own software in a way that I did not before I put in that extra effort. So it it really, it can benefit everyone, keyboard shortcuts and... Absolutely. So we have an interface for Evergreen and testing right now that Stephanie was a big part of rewriting. And this is something that I have a long personal history with. And I was just, I almost cried in a good way when I saw it because in making it more accessible, the usability has just, it is 
in a different universe than it was before. I cannot wait to share it with the rest of the community. All right, well, it looks like we have four minutes remaining and uh, at least in this room, some people may be very eager to uh, get food, but uh, I, I welcome any more questions. Uh, if anyone wants to raise hand or post in chat or raise hand in the room. Uh, otherwise, I will thank everyone. Uh, this has been a great session about making Viewfind safer and better for everyone. And uh, I appreciate all the efforts that have gone into supporting the project uh, with this research and work. You're here. I also want to throw in my, my personal thanks. This is Chris Hallberg, the front end developer for Viewfind. And I want to thank you, Stephanie, for all those pull requests. Uh, it, it's, it's something that I've been, you know, it's been on my list forever. So you moving it forward. I've been, I'm very, very personally grateful uh, for, well, for this work. Thank you for taking it seriously and, and working with them. And I'm sorry I haven't been back to push some of those over the finish line, but I will try to do that very soon. Much appreciated. All right, well, I think uh, I can actually leave the Zoom now and our recordings can go into their magic place. Okay. And uh, I will see many of you uh, later or tomorrow. Thanks, thanks for facilitating, Damien. My pleasure. Thanks and bye. Bye. Okay, bye for now. <laughs>